All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, CKA and CK, or CKAD. I'm Karen Chu, Community Program Manager at Microsoft and CNCF Ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar and we'd like to welcome our presenter today, Chris Yance, Cloud Strategist at Level 25. And just before we get started, um, a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please fill in to drop in your questions and we'll go through as many as we can. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of the Code of Conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF webinar page at www.cncf.io slash webinars. And with that, I will hand it over to Chris to kick off today's presentation. Thank you so much, Karen. It's a pleasure and welcome everyone. Um, this is going to be a little bit different of a webinar simply because, first of all, I don't really have to sell you anything. Um, this is just going to be a fun experience. Also, please do use the chat. So maybe one question up front. Do you plan to take one of these certifications in the near future or is it really something about your teams that you're interested in? So feel free to put that into the chat while I present myself a little bit. My name is Christian Janz. Oh, Jens, however you pronounce that. Um, it's a very German name in that sense. I'm a CNCF ambassador and um, I founded my own consulting company in that sense. I think I started doing that in 2013. Um, I did the CKA almost three years ago. I redid it like, I think it was two or three weeks ago to really get a feeling for the new version. I also do the CKAD for a while now. Um, in the Kubernetes project, I do a lot in KOps, so I'm one of the maintainers. I also did contribute to Zig release in 114. Sadly, my t-shirt is in laundry right now, otherwise I would have worn that. Um, but yeah, Zig release is really where I'm coming from next to COPS as an installer for Kubernetes. And also very importantly, I do hate slides a lot, so whenever I do courses or consulting, um, it starts to get messy in terms of slides, so I always bring a pen and some kind of tablet to actually do it as much interactive as possible and as white body as possible. It is so cool to see so many people that want to do the certification, especially because of if I look into the past experiences, most people that I talked to and had in courses, no matter if it was Linux Foundation courses, for example, the LFS 458, which is the Certified Kubernetes Administrator course, but also custom ones, all of the time people were in the class, but they were very afraid of actually taking the exam because if they didn't know what to expect in that sense. So I think even when the company sponsored and fully supported them, so many people didn't go because if they didn't know what to expect. So this webinar is really targeted at people that want to take the certification and also to take away a little bit of that nervousness because if you don't know what to expect in a sense of giving you as much information as possible without breaking this NDA. Um, so this is really why I'm doing this. Also Kubernetes is growing very fast. If I just look into companies in Europe, in Germany, I think you could just go to anyone and one of their like teams, departments is really trying to evaluate Kubernetes. Also looking into hardware manufacturers. So many of these are really looking into how can we implement Kubernetes to do internet of things. I think most of the hardware manufacturing companies, be it big players like Siemens, big, smaller, more niche players, all of them try to evaluate Kubernetes for running on the edge, for giving them a more powerful like deployment mechanisms on, uh, deployment mechanism on the edge without actually trying or needing access into their like clients, networks, and all of that stuff. Also in that sense, I personally took the CKA the first time because of I wanted to get some validation if I am thinking about like, do I do the right thing? Did I understand Kubernetes the right way? Or did I just make up my mind with some crazy ideas that potentially aren't the right way you should do it? So I wasn't really reading the, uh, the documentation all day and I really wanted to figure out, is this something for me? 
or isn't it? Uh, Vinay, in terms of Java developers for CKA, CKAD, this is essentially the second part of the presentation. So please just hang with me. Um, so yeah, for me, validation was a big point. I just wanted to know if I'm doing the right thing. Also because of if I fail, I can get a second retry. So even if I didn't succeed in the first time, then I got to understand the system. But in order to get the second free retry, you actually have to do it once first. Also, many clients that I've been talking to, especially building managed services products in terms of Kubernetes, they need this to be a Kubernetes certified service provider. So no matter if you live and breathe Kubernetes all day long, you need, I think as of now, it is five certified people to get that status within CNCF to really boost your like appreciation and recognition and marketing in terms of being a certified Kubernetes service provider. Without people being certified as certified Kubernetes administrator, that's simply tough for you. Also in that sense, again, Kubernetes is exploding be it your future job or be it you growing into your current job, it is really getting to understand the ecosystem, getting to understand what's currently going on in the world, um, really establishing some knowledge within yourself. So in that sense, first of all, let me start with some of the things that are really required. So if you don't know these things, you should probably not look into the CKA or the CKAD because of these things are required for all of them. First of all, you should know how Linux works, essentially in a sense of you potentially want to create a file on a Linux system. You want to read a file from the Linux system. You potentially also want to delete something from a Linux system. You need to know how a basic file system of Linux works. If you have never touched Linux, the CKA and the CKAD will be very, very tough for you because if you have to do it, not only on Linux, but what you will get is a virtual emulation of Ubuntu. So all you have is a bash terminal. There is no further tools installed except the ones you potentially require for the certification. So you really need to get your way around Linux terminals, around the bash, how to operate on a Linux system. That's hugely important. You can reconfigure the entire system. It is in a browser, but it's still your system. So if you've ever used, for example, Google Cloud, they have this virtual terminal that you can use. Azure does the same. I don't know about AWS, but like most major clouds have this terminal emulation where you just can put in stuff. This is how it feels on the exam itself as well. So if you are fami familiar with that, you will be fine. If you don't know how to use like a computer without a visual UI, you should probably look into that first. Also, because of its Ubuntu, focusing on CentOS is good. The thing is, the exam will be on Ubuntu. So getting familiar with some of the concepts and basic things in Ubuntu is always a good idea. Also in that sense, SSH. No matter which certification you take, you potentially need to talk to Kubernetes clusters. And well, if you need to talk to clusters in a sense of especially looking into administration, you might need to actually change something on the nodes or at least check something on the nodes. In that sense, you can SSH into the nodes, but you need to know how to actually do that. And last but not least, again, this is a virtual terminal. You need to know the cube control commands. It is completely irrelevant if you use the web UI to deploy your applications. I know Rancher looks super, super good in a sense of operating your clusters. Google Kubernetes engine, this is a click away to deploy your things. And also on Azure with the Azure Kubernetes service, it's really just uploading it to a web UI and it will deploy that stuff for you in Kubernetes, which is good in terms of operating clusters, but you won't get this in the CKA and CKAD. The CKAD and CKA is really focused on just bare Kubernetes as you can find it on kubernetes.io, nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. So in terms of having to do this in a more interactive way, there is no multiple choice. There is tasks that you need to fulfill. You also get some privileges. So instead of just being entirely locked down, the privileges you get is, first of all, you can do this at home, wherever you are. I have done the CKAD in a hotel room. That works. It is just your Chrome browser where you install a plugin and then you need to share your screen. But it doesn't matter where you are in the world. I did this on a cell phone connection using regular LTE. And if you have ever been in Germany, you know that's not very good internet connection. That totally works for doing the certification. It's completely fine. It's completely interactive. And also, 
for me, the internet connection dropped for like, I think half a minute or so. And after like rechecking my environment, the proctor was totally fine with it and we could just continue in the exam. So worst case, if something goes wrong, if you can explain what happened and you didn't randomly sit in another room with other like windows in behind you or something like that, that's completely fine. Um, and people are really trying to help you here. Also in sense of privileges, you get an open book policy. So instead of you having to just do it completely by yourself, having to keep everything in mind and remembering all of these nitty gritty things, in the CKA and CKAD, you get the public Kubernetes IO uh, documentation. So you have another tab in your browser, you just open a second window, you go to kubernetes.io slash docs, and whatever you find on there can be used. So if you know how to navigate kubernetes.io forward slash docs, that's ideal because of this is the entire handbook right in front of you that you can use in the entire exam. So even if you don't know what they specifically are talking about in the question, if you find the information on kubernetes.io using the search provided on kubernetes.io, you can really research new things without ever having heard of it. You just need to know how to find it in the documentation. You don't even need to necessarily know the specifics I know Kubernetes is exploding in features, but if you know how to find new features on the website, that's good enough for the certification because in real world scenarios, even at work, you don't need to know everything by heart. You need to know where to find it. Same applies to github.com. So if you are better at reading code, I'm not, but if you are, feel free to look into the source code on GitHub. That's also available to you. And last but not least, the entire Kubernetes.io blog where for example, the release team and the PR teams are doing amazing work and publishing tutorials on how to do all of these things entirely in front of you. Also, last but not least, again, you get a free retry if you fail. So don't worry too much, just do it once, figure out how the system works, get familiar with the kind of questions, get familiar with potentially even some of the questions they ask. I mean, there is a multitude of them and they rotate, but in essence, CNCF will not make up completely new questions every single time you take the exam. So if you get a feeling on how the questions are structured, you get a feeling for the entire exam. So you can really study ahead and towards this specific goal. Um, you don't need to have a Linux troubleshooting or administrator background. That's um, totally fine if you do have not. You just need to get your way around a bash console. So I've seen many engineers in, for example, companies that just use regular, you could say Windows clients, and these Windows clients are totally fine because if they just virtualize Ubuntu on top of it, use the UI for most of the parts, but kube control is still in a terminal. So if you can really type in commands in a terminal, that's usually much, much good enough for the, set, uh, for the certification. So in terms of testing environment, um, you can use any Kubernetes.io pages that's below the mentioned URLs, yes. Um, so in terms of testing environment, you need to be alone in the room. So they will scan the entire room. You have to rotate your camera in 360 degrees. You need a clean test. I was doing this in hay fever season and they asked me to remove my hay fever nose spray from the desk. So it, it, it was literally me removing everything from my desk for 10 minutes because I didn't expect them to be so strict about it, but really the desk needed to be empty. Also in terms of seeing you, there need to be a source of light, best case scenario in front of you, potentially above you, but definitely not behind you because if there shouldn't be shadows, they need to see your face and see how you are behaving. Also in that sense, a stable internet connection is useful. Last but not least, in terms of testing environment, they are very strict on, they need to see your mouth. Like I was just scratching my nose in the exam and like all of a sudden a chat window popped up being like, you're not allowed to cover your mouth because if I could be speaking to someone else in the room, which surprised me quite a lot and started to me trying to scratch my nose like, um, yeah, with one finger without trying to hide my mouth. Um, that was new for me too but it does work. You just need to get used to it. In that sense, no talking, no matter what happens, reading the questions out aloud or the tasks, that's something that might show that you are either recording something in the room or you're talking to someone else. So this is nothing you're allowed to do. Um, last but not least, no cheat sheets. Um, so I know everyone likes to get something documented or you all have aliases on your computers to use bash and all of these tools. 
I'm sorry, you can't accept if you go to Kubernetes.io, search for cheat sheet and use the official one on the documentation. That's really the only cheat sheet you can really use. Again, they screen your entire room, so you can't hide something under your desk. That's what they want to see. You can't hide something above the desk. That's what they want to see. And you can't hide it on the walls because of that's what they want to see as well. And when you first log in and talk to the person, this is what you see or a very, very, very like high level version of the screen that you're working with. So essentially on the left side, which is always orange in the following slides, this is where you see the question, meaning there you will get your instructions on what to do. And on the bottom um, down here, there you have like arrow keys to go back and forth between the actual physical questions that they want to ask you or that you are tasked with. So there is a multitude of tasks you need to solve and the left side, you can paginate through the questions. What I miss personally is as far as I'm concerned, there is no, not an easy way to flag questions. So you can still flag a question, but you, for me, what was missing was, Hey, here is a list of all the things you flagged. So remember which questions you weren't able to answer, potentially go into the notepad of the system, which is available to you and put in the identifier of the, the thing you're trying to solve. And on the right side of the screen, this is a very consistent bash. So this is your Ubuntu workstation, so to say. This is where you type your commands. You can copy and paste them there. So even in your second tab, if you just, or tab, if you just copy like manifests and stuff like that from the Kubernetes documentation, you can just paste it in there. So it's completely interactive. You're not locked into you having to retype all of that stuff. It is completely your thing as like as a terminal on, on your computer would be. And even for idiots like me, I typed in exit one time too many. So I essentially logged out of the testing interface. Um, it took a few seconds, but it reconnected me to the session and I could just continue on. So all my files were persisted, all my connections, all my configuration was still in there. So I could really just proceed with the exam without losing anything or having to redo anything. And in this virtual terminal, what you can do is you can interact with the clusters that are also mentioned in the handbook. So as like you can read in the handbook from the certification, you will get a multitude of clusters. This differs if you do CKA or CKAD, but you will get access to a certain number of clusters. And to these clusters, first of all, you can use cube control to actually connect to them. So you can talk to all of them using cube control. Your cube config is pre-populated. You don't need to worry about logging into the clusters usually. Like if the question doesn't ask you to do anything special, cube control is really a good way. Cube control is configured to be the tool of choice to talk to these clusters because of cube control is the original tool from Kubernetes. This is how you interact with the things, but you can also SSH to the nodes. So if you're not a big fan of cube control, but would rather reconfigure stuff on the server itself, potentially use Docker natively, I don't know. Um, if you manage to make Kubernetes aware of all the things you changed using Docker itself, you can SSH into the nodes. You got root on all the service you have for the exam. So anything you can do with the root on your service, this can be done on the exam as well. Again, cube control is the tool to talk to Kubernetes usually, but if you really don't want to use kube control or need some other things, SSH is your path into the clusters in, in the sense of you can really directly access the nodes. And how it feels, it's really just a kube control config use context and this is how you switch between clusters. So really don't worry about needing to know how kube config is structured and all of that stuff. You should know how that works, but in the certification, it's really testing on can you operate clusters and can you develop for clusters? So it's not about configuring your client in that sense. It's really about the other side. So kube control config use context. No, this is the command you use. This will also be shown like this is what you have to use for the specific cluster. This is your path into the system. And this is all. It's not that scary essentially. And here comes the time for the first round of questions and my wonderful um, white what skills essentially feel free to ask questions related to the exam interface itself. So this will be all that I'm talking about in the sense of this is how it feels in the exam. And in the next part, we will then talk about how to actually look into the certifications, which one to choose and how to prepare.
Questions? So there are a ton of questions already, um, but not necessarily for the interface. Let's see. Um, okay, there are a few. Um, let's see. Uh, hi, what's oh, going on? Thank you so much for asking so many questions. Wow. <laughs> Okay. Um, when editing a YAML file, what editor can we use? Can we do app install some editor? From what I've scrolled through, this answers a lot of the questions already. You can install anything that you know how to install using Aptitude because if you get an internet connected workstation and if you know how to install tools, that usually works fine. So I personally used Wim and, Vim and Nano in the exam. Both of them are potentially pre-installed if I remember correctly. I'm not entirely sure but I definitely use both of them. So you can use them, you can use Nano, both of them work fine. Okay. Um, let's see. Can we use pen and paper during things down? No, um, you can't use pen and paper. The only thing you can use is on the, like if this is your screen, on the upper right over here, um, let me make this in green potentially, here you have a button that says notepad and this is like word note like microsoft notepad or in linux like gedit stuff like that where you can really just put in comments and these comments will be like stored for you you can reopen and close that all the time um, it's just as like as in physical exams on a test center they want to get full visibility in what you are writing and doing during the exam so you can't use anything on your desk but everything that's in the tool that works well Great. Um, let's see. There's so many. Okay. Um, is it possible to install screen shell multiplexer? Yes, as I mentioned, um, it is, you got root on the system. So if you know how to install that on the system, that works. I know many people, especially ambassadors that always use or like First of all, spent the first five minutes configuring aliases um, to get a better feeling for the system, for example. Um, like everything that's doable with Bash and can be achieved with an internet connection can potentially be done. Except, well, downloading stuff from your own private website, which is the ultimate Kubernetes solver that's potentially prohibited. But um, in a sense of like popular tools like Screen, Tmux, that's not a thing. Okay. Um... This, these two are kind of similar. Um, can you have multiple screens? Is it better to just have one laptop or have additional screens? And then um, maybe related question, can you have multiple tabs open in Chrome or just one? Um, so in terms of tabs, let me answer that first. You can have one tab open. Like the only thing you are allowed to have open is one tab for the test and one for the Kubernetes website. Sometimes this happened to me, like when you click one link on kubernetes.io, um, it's configured to open up in a new window and not in the same tab. So if that opens up and you almost immediately close it again, that's fine. Like you wouldn't be shamed or blamed if it just like is a hyperlink in a new window configuration, but you're not allowed to have multiple tabs open at the same time. Also in a sense of displays or like monitors, yes and no. So I never tested it because I always did it with one and cleaned the entire desk before. But the last, like the first time I did it, what they told me was you have two options. Like, first of all, either connect the screens or remove them from the desk. So from what I can tell in terms of what the proctor said is if it's connected and they can see the content of the screen, that seems to be okay. But I wouldn't swear to God that is, this is really the thing because of this is just what I like, being stressed, being in the exam for the first time myself, this is what I think I heard. <laughs> um, kind of a similar question as well. Um, if the entire test environment is in the browser, do they force you to disable other extensions? Um, so what they will do is they will ask you, for example, on a Mac, show the currently running processes list. So force close is what they will check um, and all of the other things. Also, again, they install a browser extension to your Chrome browser, which is, I wouldn't say not remote controlled by the test system if you're in an exam, but I am very sure these systems are built in a way that you can't use Chrome, ex or like they are programmed that you can't use some kind of Chrome extensions to make it easier for you. 
So no idea, but it's prohibited in the, in the handbook and all of that stuff. So I think the system will automatically like shut down all the browser extensions that you have installed once the exam is actually starting up. Is the interface fast enough for typing? Will there be any lag? For me, it was as like as using a local terminal. So like the experience on Azure and G Cloud and AWS when you're right in front of the computer, essentially. OK. Um, should I keep asking questions or? Um, maybe next? two more, and then um, we can continue with the other ones. OK. Um, I think you may have gone over this, but can I skip questions? Yes, you can go back and forth all the time. Like the thing is, you configure clusters in Kubernetes. The task is to solve problems in these clusters. But um, like you can change things in a completely messed up order. Like the questions are not really related to each other potentially. It's really one task for one domain of the exam. And each question is rated separately because of this is not do something and if you didn't do it correctly, like everything else breaks and you can't pass the exam. This is really trying to show, do you have a broad knowledge of the domain? So do you know anything that's required? Meaning in that sense, yeah, essentially the questions are usually not, like they are related to each other in terms of different or same field of domain, but you don't have to do the first one to even be able to answer the second one. Great. Um, what editors are available on the Linux emulator? I didn't test it completely. Um, again, I use VI and Vim all the time. That was available. So I expect on default Ubuntu Nano to be installed as well, simply because Ubuntu is trying to be a distribution that is very, very easy to use for people coming from Windows environments and all of that stuff. So it's really trying to make it easy to work with tools that are essentially not trying to teach you commands and all of that stuff on a keyboard that you need to remember. But VI and Nano is probably what's installed, everything else. It's like, I just see the last comment, um, editors like gedit, no, because of it's only a terminal. Like you can't run terminals in that thing. It's really all in your browser. You can't really run simulators and all of that stuff on it. But everything that can be done on the terminal is fine. Okay, in that sense, let's continue with the contents. Um, I've tried to put the, the two next to each other as much as possible. So if you look into domain um, for the application developer, it is really focused on getting stuff in the cluster. So core concepts, like just basic Kubernetes domains, like what is a pod, what's a deployment, what's a stateful set eventually, what, how to get volumes into the system, how to make my application run everything except building your own Docker images, because of this would be Docker certification program. So everything that's already in a container image, how can you run it in Kubernetes? And also how you can configure that. And if you combine these two domains, you already got 31% uh, of the exam, essentially. So it's really how to package something up. Also looking into multi-container pods, like thinking about all of the different things you can do with these patterns that are in the courses. So um, extending containers functionality using different methodologies, um, also using services, how to find different things in your Kubernetes cluster, but also last but not least really how to design everything. Like should you put like mount dev random in your, con in your Java container and not program a heap size for your container? Or eventually should you do actually really set a heap size and stuff like that? Like just things, what is clever about pod design? How should you structure your deployments in Kubernetes? Also, of course, in a sense, is the pod really the, the correct way of abstraction for this? Really just working with the basic premises in Kubernetes is usually what the application developer is asking you to do. So you're not worrying about the cluster itself, but everything that's running in the cluster. So as soon as you have a Kubernetes cluster handed to you, when you get a configuration file from an operator, for example, you use any kind of managed Kubernetes or you use Rancher Kubernetes engine to install Kubernetes. And now you need to deploy something in that cluster. CKAD, so the application developer, is usually the exam that you should probably look into. If you go down the rabbit hole even further, or you use an installer that's running on-premises, 
the administrator is usually the way you should look into. Also, the administrator is the only one that counts towards that goal of five certified people in a sense of being eligible for the uh, Kubernetes Certified Service Provider Program. The administrator is taking the same things, but again, really summing it up as core concepts in that sense. So most of the things that are just not on the right side, that's 90% core concepts in Kubernetes. Um, also, installation, configuration, and validation. Keep in mind, this exam is about the Kubernetes project itself. So it's talking about tools that are documented and explained on Kubernetes.io. Third-party installers that are not on Kubernetes.io are not relevant for the certification because of this is not a vendor certification for a specific Kubernetes engine, but for Kubernetes, you could say off the shelf. So know how to work with the tools that Kubernetes is publishing as the tools to use and op like to operate Kubernetes. What is also, if you look into Zik release, what are the tools that Kubernetes is releasing themselves using their release cycles? These are the tools that are potentially interesting to you for the administrator because of this is what the Kubernetes project is really publishing. Application lifecycle management plays into that as well. So how to remove something from the cluster, how to add something from the cluster, how to mutate things in the cluster. I wouldn't say you need to be an expert in CI CD, but you should know concepts of actually changing things during the life cycle of a pod or a deployment or anything else in your cluster. In terms of networking, know the different network plugins, but again, network plugins are usually third party things. So know about the network configurations that you can do in Kubernetes coming from the Kubernetes project. Same for scheduling. You most definitely don't need to develop your own scheduler, but you should know how scheduling in, in Kubernetes works itself. Security, how to make sure that certificates match and all of that stuff. Really anything you would like get blamed for if it doesn't work by a security official itself. Cluster maintenance, I think this really plays along with installation and configuration. Logging and monitoring, where are these logs stored? Where do they come from? How to get them? How to get them from containers? But again, this is cluster administrator, so also how to do it with the cluster itself. Last but not least, storage, how to store files, how to share files and different things in the cluster. And last but not least, something could be broken at some point in time. Like if I remember back into the Kubernetes clusters that we operated in the real world, most of the time something broke. And the worst thing that happened to me was one guy being scared we got hacked. So he's just started randomly deleting stuff from the Kubernetes control plane using the Kubernetes dashboard. In that sense, you should be capable of re recovering from that situation. Like the worst thing that could happen for you is Kubernetes itself not running anymore because of someone misconfigured, deleted, or just messed with the control plane. Um, or the control plane just doesn't work. The control plane was never installed. All of these things, like know the control plane if you look into the Kubernetes certified Kubernetes administrator exam. And that's usually all it takes and also the decision tree in taking this. So really, if you look into the Kubernetes Certified Service Provider Program, you have to go with the CKA route. There is no other choice. And then if you don't want to take these um, like Certified Service Provider Program, you just need to deploy something, but you want to verify if you're following best practices, how to run stuff the right way, then use the application developer. That's usually good enough. Essentially, it's not a question wise equivalent with more tasks to solve, but usually from a scope of like priorities, the administrator kind of includes the application developer simply because of stuff that developers broke potentially end up having to be solved by the administrator in a sense. So yeah, application developer is really, you could say the, the smaller brother of the tool. It's also younger because of the administrator is really all inclusive in what you can potentially do. Comparing them even further, application developer takes two hours and it's 19 problems that you have to solve. It's really targeted for developers and DevOps engineers in a sense of, this is really differentiating from company to company because for some companies, DevOps engineer is really developer. I know other companies that just renamed operations to DevOps. Um, and if you just renamed uh, like operations to DevOps, administrator is usually the path you want to go. 
But if DevOps is really hands-on development and not cluster operation, because if you potentially use some kind of managed Kubernetes offering, application developer is usually the route you should take. Administrator is one hour of time more for 24 problems you have to solve. Personally, I thought the application developer is a little bit harder than the administrator when I took it the first time because of one hour less for only five more problems, right? So if you compare the number of tasks you have to solve, it's really not that much different, even though you got 60 minutes more time in that regard. So for me, um, in the application developer, I took, I think, one hour 40 when I started with Kubernetes, which was like 10 to 20 minutes left in the end. The administrator, the first time it took me the same amount of time, but for five problems more because of, I was also working with the administrative parts. The second time I took the CKA like two weeks ago, if you get used to Kubernetes and do it hands on for a few years, like the last time I did the CKA, I was done in 55 minutes, which can also be done in that regard. So don't worry too much about time. The entire certification is built in a way that you can solve everything using the resources provided. So if you know your way around Kubernetes.io, this is what I did for the most part when I did it the first time. It's really copy paste from, from Kubernetes.io um, and that works. So the only thing you have to keep in mind then is time. It's built in a way that if you have enough time, the certification can be solved by anyone that ever touched a computer. This is why time is the real limit here and why it's so hard coded and strictly enforced. To study, first of all, create clusters. Again, use the tools the Kubernetes project is provided. Know how to use the tool because of this is the only tool Kubernetes is really publishing. Also, as of today, the certification is running on Kubernetes version 1.18. So it doesn't matter if you know how to install Kubernetes in 1.15 because of the certification is testing on Kubernetes version 1.18. Also, I know version 1.19 is already in alpha, but it doesn't matter if you know how to deploy Kubernetes in the alpha version because of the certification is on 1.18. This is the only path possible. Also in that sense, know how to update clusters. Do it one or two times. Maybe install it in an old version, bring it to the new version, try to downgrade, try to mess with it. Really just get a demo set up, get some virtual machines using any kind of virtualization technology like KVM and just start playing with it using the tools that is on Kubernetes.io. Also in that sense, using troubleshooting without leaking information that I'm not allowed to, Kubernetes.io is having a great uh, like documentation article on how to debug clusters that go through the entire stack of Kubernetes and where to check if something is broken and stuff like that. Same for the candidate handbook. Like it is, I think, five to seven pages of information. What are you allowed to do during the exam and what aren't you allowed during the exam? And last but not least, on CNCF slash curriculum on GitHub, it's the entire curriculum. Essentially what I've just been talking about, but it is there on GitHub and updated every single time they also update the certification exam. Also keep in mind, um, in a sense of Kubernetes courses, this is how Kubernetes is essentially built. So you have an API server and Kubelet is talking to the API server. This is a regular structure of Kubernetes. Whatever course you take, no matter from Linux foundation or not, this is what you learn. So keep the architecture of Kubernetes in mind. You have to know how the basics of the architecture work. Even if you go in the application developer thing, like you really have to keep in mind how is Kubernetes built from a basic architecture. All the links will be in the presentation that you get after the certification. Very, very important parental advisory, whatever you want to call this, learn playing Kubernetes. It doesn't matter if you excel in Kubernetes or Rancho Kubernetes engine or OpenStack or anything else on the world. There is thousands of installers. You need to know playing Kubernetes. This is what this exam is about. It doesn't matter that you do something else in your own company because of CNCF is testing for the open source published by the Kubernetes project installer and tools, components, and all of the things in there. Don't go and say, but we do it differently because of personally, to be honest, no one cares if you do it differently because of this certification program is not done by someone else, but the Kubernetes project itself. And the Kubernetes project itself 
as like as everyone, usually we pride ourselves in doing it the way we regard as the right way of doing something. So we expect you to do it that way that we envision things to be done, more or less. Some hacks. Um, you potentially have to create some manifests. Exactly, this is how you interact with Kubernetes. And um, I mean, I personally hate doing things all over the time, but also I don't want to search on kubernetes.io all the time. So for example, dry run, as of now, I learned you have to run equals client, otherwise you get an error on the newest Kubernetes releases. But a dry run and minus O YAML really helps in generating these manifests so that you don't have to type everything by yourself all the time. Also in that regard, I don't know how many of you know Cube Control Explain, but instead of going to the Kubernetes website and trying to click through the reference um, website, you can just run Cube Control Explain pod.spec.containers and you get a detailed documentation on which key value pairs you have available to put into that manifest. So you don't have to jump back and forth from console to the other tab to actually research something on the website. You can really all do it in the console because of Cube Control Explain allows you to do that. Also, get is great. But essentially, if you try to debug something, describe is the human readable way in that sense. Also, like the certification is built in a way of testing on time and being able to solve problems in a timely manner. So I would prefer the human easy way to solve the problems instead of trying to do it machine readable. Humans are not machines, so describe is usually a better way of trying to get output from the Kubernetes CLI in that sense. Also, very important, be positive about it. Like this certification program was not built to make you fail. This certification program was built to get as many people certified as possible to spread the word around Kubernetes. So always keep that in the back of your head. This was built to be solvable. This was built to share the spirit of Kubernetes. So it is definitely doable. And there are thousands of people that already did it. And so many people succeeded in it. And if you really just know your way around Kubernetes, I am very sure most of the people can go through it if they just study enough and really are not scared to even register. I know so many people that would easily get through it from what I've seen, but they just don't because if they say, oh, but this could be tough and this could be challenging and they never submit the registration for it. And this is really sad simply because of it could be so much more certified people already if you just gave it a try. Again, if you fail, you get a free retry. So there is no lose, there is just win or win. Again, it's doable by anyone if you have enough time. And also in a sense of how complex can this be? And if I have to solve problems, like this could be anything. In the end, what counts is if this problem is solved. It doesn't matter if you like write telegrams to Kubernetes uh, in the cluster or if you do it in telnet, uh, telnet or if you use cube control or anything, it just has to be solved. So in a sense, it is automated in terms of validation. It takes some time to get the result, but CNCF prides itself with this certification being checked by an automated validation engine. So there is no person saying, yeah, this could be solved, but I'm not entirely sure, but there is a machine saying, yes, this problem is solved or this problem is not solved. And this is what you're graded on. Again, core Kubernetes, I can't stress this enough. Don't rely on, um, for example, having tools like kubeNS or kube context and all of these things. Like extensions are usually not installed, so really focus on core Kubernetes. This is what this is all about. Again, also everything can be solved with kubernetes.io. So you don't need to go and buy all of these fancy books by great authors. I'm not saying you shouldn't buy them, but in a sense, you don't have to. Like if you know your way around the documentation, that is more than good enough. Like mastering the documentation of Kubernetes, even in Linux Foundation trainings is a core component in what we teach. So take that to your advantage, know your way around the documentation and you're usually good. Last but not least, have fun. The more you stress yourself, the more errors you do. Also in my perspective, like when I get stuck on a question, I start to overanalyze. So just go on, do something else. You can go back and forth in the questions use that, like just go onward, solve the next problems, get all of these percentages and then go back when you have time in the end. Again, time is the only limit, but the order is totally up to you. Last but not least and foremost, um, you can learn this with instructors. 
So for example, on Linux Foundation Training, uh, Tim Sarovich um, authored the good courses LFS 458, which is Kubernetes administration and LFD 459, which is the developer course, which is also completely available um, online. I think it's starting with a two, but the last two numbers are essentially the same. So you can do it self-paced. Um, and again, keep in mind, there is a 2020 promo. I think it's 30% off if you go to Linux Foundation Training. Um, again, I also do these courses, both virtual and in person. During Corona times, it's more virtual than in person. But again, please also feel free to come back to me and ask any other questions. Um, but last but not least, let's answer all the questions that are open in terms of should I do CKA or should I do CKAD and all of that stuff? Um, so someone specifically asked, um, they are a Java developer, so should they do CKA or CKAD? I think um, if you are not actually going into operating the cluster yourself, you should stick with the CKAD. And then once you've got that, under your like um, umbrella, you could continue on and potentially look into the CKA. But CKAD is probably a good start. Overall, is an administrator certification considered to be more valuable than the developer one? I think it's not really more valuable. It's more, it's different aspects. So as a developer, you usually don't need to know how to operate a cluster. And on the other side, if you're an administrator, you don't need to know the nitty gritty details on how this one flag is called to do something with a pod and all of that stuff, simply because of you are more into architecting the bigger picture of the cluster itself. So it's really just trying to each fit into a specific niche, depending on what you do. As a Java developer, it's usually like you don't operate clusters. You potentially don't know Linux that well. Um, so CKAD is ideal for you. On the other side, CKA, if you operate Linux all the time, that's probably more of the natural choice for you in that sense. Um, so someone has a question for beginners. What is the best path to kickstart the CKA for novices? The CKA what? Or I assume CKA exam for novices, for people who are- Oh, for novices, novices. yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's a good idea to look into um, like really get a feeling for the documentation. And then I think the best path is really just do it once because of then you get a feeling for it. Again, if you succeed the first time, probably it was just easy peasy. But if you don't, you learn so much from just going to, uh, through the question and understanding what's the CKA and CKAD is testing for that you can then very specifically focus on these things. And then you get another year to take another try at it or get a retry, which is completely included. Like you don't have to pay for it. It's one year of studying and then you can do it again. So really, I can only recommend just do it. Like it's, it's more scary than it, like it, it sounds more scary than it really is. But if you do, have done it once, you know what the structure is. Like I can't leak any of the questions and all of that stuff. But in that sense, once you got an understanding for the type of testing, it falls very natural usually. So you just need to get a feeling for the type of testing. Um, so kind of follow up question, are there any practice exams or do you just take it once and like you said? As far as I know, no, but there is like, if you go to l.cncf.io, there is a huge like landscape of things you can look into, which is also listing some like study yourself things where you can potentially get a sacrificial cluster and then run commands against it, which also visualizes what you've just done and stuff like that. Really, I think the best way to study for both of the exams is really just install your own cluster as like you would on the LFS 458, so the Linux Foundation Kubernetes Administrator class in the first lab essentially, or also in the classes you can get elsewhere. And then you just play with it for like three to four to five days. So really just mess with the cluster is usually the best way to actually study. Just set yourself a goal and then go through with it. Because of this is really what the entire CKA and CKAD is about. You need to be able to set up a cluster and go through with it up until you don't need the cluster anymore and potentially need to remove everything, right? So this is how typical clusters in corporate America and corporate world work. 
At some point you install them, then you do stuff with them. And at some point there is, I don't know, Kubernetes 2.0 and you have to reinstall everything from scratch. Um, so I think this references your chart earlier. Um, so it looks like the both exams can be applied to people with a DevOps background. Like, is it important for them to do both certifications? Not really, no. Um, so <laughs> it, I think the DevOps word is just really put into so many different contexts around the world, right? So I know some DevOps engineers that just got named DevOps engineers after it was cool and um, they needed that. So they said, okay, you did operations, now you're a DevOps engineer. Um, so for you, CKA is probably the better choice. But on another side, like if you run on any managed Kubernetes service offering, so for example, there is a Novo Cloud or there is Kubernetes, which you can install in your systems, or there's Google Kubernetes Engine, there is Azure Kubernetes Service, there is Elastic Kubernetes Service by AWS. If you run on any of them, you really don't need to worry about operating service anymore because of this is what all of these different vendors do for you. Um, so you shouldn't really be all that interested into the CKAD simply because of, hey, you don't need to do that. This is what all of these service partners do for you already. So focus on what's important for you, really developing your application. So their CKAD is probably the way easier choice, essentially. Um, someone asked, are there any stats on the total number of CK attempts and the total number of CK certifications issued? Not that I know of any, but I think from people I've talked to personally, it, um, it was very even. Like, like, I think it, it's really a bit moved in that sense because of the people I talk to, most of them that were not ready were the ones that just did it to get a feeling for it. And all the ones that are regarded as, dude, you should just do it. They were like, oh no, and I'm not like confident enough and all of that stuff. So I think my numbers are really moved to a, a, a certain extreme. But um, for me, it has always been around 50-50 from the people I had in my courses essentially or talk to. Do you mind if we jump into more general questions again? No, no, that's, that's fine. Okay, um, any tips on time management? I mean, you can go back and forth all the time. So maybe screen all of the problems first and then you can really pick the easy ones first. And so you can like get more slack um, on the ones you're not sure about. So everyone gets stuck at one point. Like there is always something you've never heard about and or potentially you just don't understand the wording, right? So many people take the exam that are not native English speakers. Um, so really do the ones that just speak to you first. Again, you can do that. You can go back and forth all the time. You can flag the questions, really just get a feeling for it and then focus on the ones that you can get the most points that are the easiest and then go on with the harder ones for less points essentially. Um, speaking of points, uh, can you talk a little bit more about scoring? Like, is there a partial scoring or is it just binary? I really don't know. Um, <laughs> so what you see is the current question is coming from area, let's say administration, and this is scored at 7% for the exam. So you get a feeling of, Hey, if I get all of the administration ones, right, I potentially get 7%. Um, but the scores I got really didn't add up with the um, like scores of the exam essentially. So like getting, for example, 87% is not doable with the amount of like percentages you get on the agenda in the candidate handbook. So I have to guess that potentially there is like sub scores essentially, but no promise. This was really just what I have seen. Okay. Um, I guess, yeah, kind of, this is probably, you're probably going to give some more answer. Like, is there a clear passing score then? I think um, on the website, when you register, um, I've seen something like that, but I'm not entirely sure. I think there is, but not that I'm aware of what it currently is. Okay, let's see. Um, when do you get your score? For me, it, the first time it took like five to seven days, I think. Um, but yeah, um, last time it took three days. Got it. Um, and then let's see. Sorry, there are a lot of questions. 
Also in that sense, if you want to leave, uh, feel free to like email if you have any more questions. Also on the Kubernetes Slacks, I'm always Chris Z100 or on Twitter. Um, so if you're not interested in the questions coming up anymore, feel free to like reach out. Thank you so much for coming and back into the questions. Um, a few people ask this, is kubectl auto completion turned on? <laughs> Let's say I'm not saying it's turned off, but I'm also not saying it's turned on, but auto completion is a feature of cube control. So if you know how to get that turned on, it doesn't matter if it's turned on or not. So just really know how to use cube control. All of the features in cube control can be used. So if you know how to activate it yourself, you can definitely use it. If you don't, you can eventually use it if it's turned on per default. Um, someone said, it seems like in essence, building um, your own exam based on Kubernetes.io and the command line is the way forward. That's what you get as resources. So I'm not very good at answering questions using um, GitHub. Essentially, I'm not reading through, like in Kubernetes, so much code is generated. I'm not reading through thousands of lines of generated code to get a feeling of, hey, what could be the right way of solving this? So for me, Kubernetes.io, especially using the reference handbook and also using kube control explain was the more natural way of solving the issues because of this is how I could more specifically look into what I was trying to find. But if you're good at looking at code, I mean, also github.com slash Kubernetes is available to you. So feel free. Um, last question that I'm going to squeeze in. Are there any restrictions on the number of lines you can copy and paste from Kubernetes.io? Kubernetes um, Again, the entire thing is solvable only using Kubernetes.io if you have enough time. So I wouldn't say you should focus on just copy and pasting everything, um, but not that I know that they keep count of how much stuff you really copy. So, um, I mean, it is there to help you. There is no limit on, oh, you get like 500 times help and then you have to know it by yourself. Got it. Okay. Um, thanks, Krish, uh, for a great presentation. That is all the time we have questions for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. The webinar recording and slides will be online later today, and we look forward to seeing everyone at a future CNCF webinar. Thank you, and have a great day.